and so we have hope. My name is PJ. I'm one of the pastors here and one of the members, and it's a joy to bring you God's word this morning as we do our last um, sermon on Psalms for, for this, at least this current season, and we're going to go into a different series next. But we're in Psalms now, so because man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, please take your Bibles and open it to Psalm 63. Psalm 63, it's on page 504 in the Pew Bible. If you don't have a Bible of your own, there's a hardcover, black hardcover Bible in the chair in front of you. You can turn to page 504 and 505, and we'll look at Psalm 63 this morning. I am reading out of the Christian Standard Bible. It's not too different from your own translation. Um, the 2020 text edition of the CSB, so... Some of the Pew Bibles are the 2017, so sometimes there's a word or two that's different, but out of the Christian Standard Bible. All right, let's hear God's word from Psalm 63, and then we'll pray. Jump in. A Psalm of David, when he was in the wilderness of Judah. God, you are my God. I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you. My body faints for you in a land that is dry, desolate, and without water. So I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory. My lips will praise, will glorify you because your faithful love is better than life. So I will bless you as long as I live. At your name, I will lift up my hands. You satisfy me as with rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I think of you as I lie on my bed, I meditate on you during the night watches because you are my helper. I will rejoice in the shadow of your wings. I follow close to you. I cling close to you. Your right hand holds on to me. But those who intend to destroy my life will go into the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the power of the sword. They will become a meal for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by him will boast, for the mouths of liars will be shut. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the word of Christ dwell richly among us in all wisdom. Father in heaven, we ask now that you would open our hearts and minds to see wonderful things here in your word. Father, we have not turned from your judgments, for you yourself have instructed us. And so therefore, Lord, we ask that you um, would give us life in your ways. Indeed, your hands formed us and made us. So give us understanding so that we can learn your commands. May your faithful love comfort us as you promised your servants. May your compassion come to us so that we may live for your instruction is our delight. Lord, let the arrogant be put to shame for slandering your, you and your people with lies. We will meditate on your precepts. So we ask, Father, that you would let those who fear you those who know your decrees, turn to your Son, our Lord Jesus. May our hearts be blameless regarding your word and your statutes, so that we will not be put to shame. Speak to us now, God. We need your grace to see and feel and love and repent and move by your Spirit, according to your word, your, your word for the glory of your Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Once upon a time, there was a king, and the king had ruled over uh, his land for many, many years successfully and joyfully and faithfully. He was a mighty king and really, for the most part, a really, really good king. He had his flaws, like all kings have their flaws, like all humans have flaws. And one day, he heard a report that a man in his kingdom had swayed his countrymen to rebel against him, rebel against the king, to kill him and to 
become the king, to usurp the throne. This king heard the news, considered the situation, realized that he was indeed outnumbered, that he did not have the upper hand, that he had lost the, the majority of the people. He realized that the, the majority of the military were swayed by this rebel, this um, usurper of the throne. And so he realized that he had to flee. There was no choice. If he stayed in the kingdom and in the palace and in the city and sought to fight off with his loyal soldiers, fight off the rebels, he would lose. He would certainly die. Imagine being on the run for your life where you know you're vulnerable and your enemy has the upper hand. You can't go to the police or to the military or to any court because this man has the power. He has all the human power in the situation. Not only that, but imagine that this was your son or your brother, someone close to you who ought to be loyal to you. That's, what the story, that's, that's what's happening in this story. The rebel here was the king's son. Now, this is a true story. This is a story about King David and his son named Absalom. Yeah, his son named Absalom. David was king for many years, and Absalom had persuaded the whole nation to follow him instead and declared him king. And, so, and Absalom was going to march with the military into the palace, kill his dad, the king, King David, and take over Jerusalem and really over the nation. So David fled to the wilderness of Judah with fear and alarm, with a certain sense of unsettledness, and a heart shattered into a thousand pieces. A broken heart. Have you ever found yourself unsettled like David? In a season of unsettledness. A lack of peace, a fear or a concern that overwhelms. Has your heart ever been shattered into a thousand pieces? Have you found yourself in a wilderness like David? A dry place, a weary place, a place with no water, no resources, no, no comforts, just desert. Have you ever been overwhelmed by the unsettledness of your life? What should you do when you find yourself in the wilderness? Some of you are in that season right now and have been there for a really long time, too long. Others of you are not in that season for the moment, but you will be soon enough. Life is a season of suffer is life is suffering and you get some breaks along the way. But what should you do when you are in the wilderness? Well, David shares his experience with us in this poem, in this psalm, so that we could understand and see God's glory when we find ourselves in the wilderness. So let's, to get the main goal, we're actually going to spend a lot of time in the text. So maybe, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes before, we even, before I even tell you the main goal, because it's coming from verses 1 and 2. So let's just walk through verses 1 and 2 and see the main goal here. But after we med meditate on this, this, um, these two verses, then we'll unpack this main goal with the rest of the psalm. So look at verse one. God, here's David in the wilderness. God, you are my God. What does he mean, God, you are my God? That seems like an obvious statement. I mean, how many gods are there? There's only one God. Of course, God is your God. David, he's the only God. But can we have other gods? Yes, we can, right? Money. Jesus said you can only serve one, uh, no man can serve two masters. You either serve God or serve money. You can't serve both, but some people treat money like a God. When you're in your wilderness, sometimes money would solve the problem, it seems, right? Or power, influence. Maybe another person is your God, a specific relationship where you really want peace or approval or affirmation from somebody so much that that becomes your God, right? That person becomes your God. We are all tempted constantly to have other gods, 
in the midst of these pressures and temptations to find another God, in the wilderness, David declares that God is his God. You know what happens when you're in the wilderness? You run to your God. You look for your God. That's what everyone does. You don't have to be religious to look for your God. You don't have to be religious to have a God. You just find yourself in a tough situation. You're unsettled. You're overwhelmed. You're broken. You have no, no one seems to be able to help. Where am I going to find help? Well, what, whatever you run to, whoever you run to, is your God. And so it's not a throwaway line to say, God, you're my God. God David is saying, I'm in the wilderness. I'm desperate. And God is my God. Not money, not comfort, not safety from the enemy, not the enemy dying, not a stronger military, the stronger military is not my God, not the consensus of the people in the situation will be my God. No, in this situation, in this wilderness, God, you, you are my God. And so I eagerly seek you. I wonder what you're tempted to run to as your God in this season of your life. I'm currently tempted to run to the God of 2023, like keeping this year of my life as my life in some ways, or maybe even 2022 where I'm in my mid forties, so I'm midlife crisis type season of life. But right now my parents are still alive. Children, we did lose rise last year, but my, the rest of my children are still alive. I've had a few losses, but generally this season of my life, it's just every, mostly everyone is still here and around. That's not gonna last. Life is a vapor, right? So what is your, what is a decade of your life? It's even less than a vapor. I wish I could just hold on to this season, but I feel like I'm idolizing this season. What is your God in your wilderness? For David, God is his God. And if you're a Christian, who is your God? The Lord Jesus is your God, right? If you're a Christian, you have decided to follow Jesus. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, this wouldn't happen to you, this is what you did. Let a man deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. That's what you've decided to do if you're a Christian. Jesus is your God, even in the wilderness. He's your God, he's your Lord. Therefore, what does David do? If God is your God, therefore, I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you. So look, look at this. David is seeking God eagerly, early, urgently. And then he says, I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you. David is thirsty for God. He wants God. He's in a, it says in, he's in a land that is dry and desolate and without water. He has no other resources. He's thirsty and his thirst is for God. The thirstiest I've ever been in my life was not just one occasion, but a, a, a year of occasion. It was when I played high school basketball. And uh, in practice, I never thought I could be so thirsty. But running lines and 17s over and over and over again till some of our basketball team is throwing up, like in practice, they're throwing up out of, out of thirst. And our coach would not let us go to the water fountain. Just kept running and running and running. If you miss a breather, just keep running. And he would not let us go. And then when he'd blow the whistle and say, water break, man, everyone would run to the water fountain and drink, and water had never tasted so good. Water was so good, and you're, you're almost tempted to push everyone out of the way, but you know everyone's as just as thirsty as you are, they have a right to the desperation just as much as you. Well, imagine someone who's been in the desert for a day and hasn't had any water, and he finally finds some water, and there you are standing between him and the water. And you're like, hold on, hold on, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me talk to you first. Can you, let me, can you give me 10 minutes first before, before you get some water? What, what is he gonna do? <laughs> Someone say he'll kill you. Yeah, I mean, he's certainly gonna push you out of the way, right? Like, I don't have any time. I don't have. Z I have zero seconds to wait for you. I need water right now. Get out of my way, right? I mean, like the desperation you'd feel if you haven't had water for 24 hours in a hot desert with no shade, and then you see water in front of you, and someone's trying to stop you, even for one minute. No, that's not happening, right? Like, get get out of my way. I need water. 
Here's David in a dry and desolate place without water. And who is he thirsting for? Not water. He's thirsting for God. God, I need you. I need more of you. David is not satisfied with his current spiritual state and longings. If we're Christians, we ought not to be satisfied with our current spiritual state, our current longings. We are not satisfied and filled with joy as we desire to be. We want more. It is a longing and thirst for God that David and God's people have for God. I mean, it, it goes so far that David says in verse one, my body faints for you. Typically, we think of this as a spiritual thirst. David doesn't have a division between spiritual and physical at this point. He's even saying just physically, my body thirsts for you. My body faints for you. I don't want you just spiritually. I want you. I need you, God. I need you in my life. I need more of you. I'm desperate for you. My body yearns for you, says one translation. And so what do you do when you're thirsting for God and you can't find God, you can't find a satisfaction for your thirst anywhere in the land all around you. Where do you go? What do you do if you need more of God? What does David do? Look at verse two. So because I'm thirsty, because there's no water anywhere around me, where do I go? What do I do? So I what? I gaze on you where? In the sanctuary. Because I'm thirsty, I gaze on you in the sanctuary because I need that thirst to be quenched. What is that thirst to be quenched? Look at verse 2 again. I gaze on you in the sanctuary. Why does he gaze on God in the sanctuary? Why? To see what? To see your strength and your glory. There is the satisfaction of the thirst. I'm thirsty for your glory. I'm thirsty for your strength. I'm thirsty to experience you afresh. I need more of you. I need to see your strength and your glory. So David gazes on God in the sanctuary to see his glory. There's a lot of things we could say here. I need to try to keep this short because I want to move on to the rest of the psalm, but I, want to, I don't want to rush um, thinking about this verse and this and unpack some of the themes here. What is God's glory? What is God's glory? Well, what does it mean to see God's glory? I want, I, I want, I'm going to the sanctuary because I want to gaze on you to see your glory. What does it mean to see God's glory? Well, there was a man who asked to see God's glory. He actually said to God, show me your glory. Who, who said that? Moses. Moses did, right? Moses said, show me your glory. Good guess for everyone else. Thank you for guessing. Yeah. <laughs> Moses said, show me your glory. And so God, so and does God say yes or no? He said, yes, but his answer is strange. God says, uh, this is um, Exodus 33, I think, verse 19. Show me your glory. And God says, I will declare to you my goodness. That's weird. I want you to show me your glory. What, 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 um, what sense is going to be used to, to when the glory is shown? My eyes. I want to see your glory. And God says, okay, yes, I will Declare my goodness. I'll proclaim my name. I will proclaim my goodness. That doesn't use the eyes. What does that use? Ears. I want to see your glory. God says, yes, I'll give it to you. I'm going to proclaim my name and declare my goodness to your ears. Strange way of seeing glory. And so what, what, does, what does God do? He puts Moses in the cleft of a rock. And not that God has actual hands and a back, but it uses that. And it, it says, you know, God puts him there and then covers Moses in the cleft and then walks because no man can see God's face and live. He walks in front of Moses and then he turns to the side and walks away. And as he's walking away from Moses, Moses is able to see the back of his glory. But that's not the most important part, as amazing as that is. The most important part is that as he's doing that, God is declaring his name. And what does God say as he's walking? What is the proclamation of his goodness or of his name? What does he say? He says, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. I'm sorry, abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love for thousands of for thousands and thousands, or to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. 
but who will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the consequences to the father's iniquity on the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. What does that mean? So what's God's glory? What's the proclamation? His name, Yahweh, the covenant God. And who is Yahweh? Who is God? He's compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, praise God, but who will by no means clear the guilty. He will not leave the guilty unpunished. He will punish the guilty and he'll punish them not only on the fathers, but on the father's children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. How's that for Father's Day? <laughs> your sin will be passed on to your children. God will punish not only you for your sins, he'll punish your children and your children's children to the third and fourth generation. That's the glory of God. The goodness of God. The goodness of God. And how does that even work? I will forgive iniquity and I will not leave the, those who have iniquity unpunished. If you're going to forgive iniquity, you're not going to punish them. But if you're not going to leave the guilty unpunished, which means you're going to punish them for their iniquity, right? How do you clear the guilty and not clear the guilty at the same time? That's not possible. Pick one, God. Are you going to leave the guilty unpunished? Or are you gonna punish the guilty? You can't do both, God. You can't, you can't do both, God. Or, or, or can, can God do both? Well, let's go back to verse chapter uh, Psalm 63, verse two. Where does David, so David's not where Moses is. Moses was on Mount Sinai seeing God's glory. Where's David going? Look, David doesn't go back to Mount Sinai. David says, I wanna see your glory. I wanna gaze on you, God. So where does he go? <laughs> to the sanctuary. What is, what is the sanctuary? Anyone know what the sanctuary is? What are some key words that come to your mind? Temple. Temple Ark of the Covenant. Holy, God, holy place. The Holy of Holies. The tabernacle. Now, the, the temple is not built yet because Solomon built the temple. It's still the tabernacle. The sanctuary is the holy place. And behind the holy place, you have the Holy of Holies. And who can go into the Holy of Holies? The high priest. And how often? Only once a year. Can David ever go into the Holy of Holies? No. Can he ever look into the Holy of Holies? No. So he's not even trying to look there. He's not saying, I'm trying to gaze at your glory in the Holy of Holies. He's not even going there. I'm looking to the sanctuary, the holy place. Maybe because when the priest goes in, I can, I can kind of get a peek inside. So David wants to go to the tabernacle and see the holy place because he wants to see God's strength and God's glory. Now... If you went to the tabernacle during David's time, what would you see? You'd see sacrifices. You'd see a lot of blood. You'd see blood in basins. You would see, yeah, you'd see all kinds of dead animals that are being sacrificed. Who would be, who would be um, performing the sacrifices? The priests. So you would see priests. And you'd see priests, and they would be dressed in their white linen cloth. They're dressed kind of peculiar. Nobody in the world, nobody in the country dresses like them. They're just very peculiar. And then there's one who's dressed even more peculiar. He is the high priest. And he is dressed in a different color. He also has a breastplate and he has 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. He has a different hat on than the other priests do. And they are there. So the priests are making sacrifices. What else are the priests doing? They're what? They're sprinkling uh, I don't know if they're sprinkling. Moses does that, but there's blood. So they're, they're taking the sacrifice. They're taking your hand. They're putting your hand on the sacrifice. They're confessing your sins. They are mediating God's blessing to you. They'll even do the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. They're announcing blessing on God's people who ought to be cursed. They're making sacrifices. They're mediating the atonement for the people. They're dressed representing the people. And priests are also teaching God's words to the people. So what does David see? He sees the strength and glory of God in God forgiving sins through sacrifice. He sees God clearing the guilty, but they're guilty of their sin, but they don't get the sin covered. The sin, or they don't, they don't pay for their own sin. The animal that was just, their, their throat was just slit. That animal is being punished for the sin. So they see forgiveness. They see mediation. 
They see atonement. They see blessing. They receive teaching from God's word. They learn how to interpret the rest of their life by the teaching of God's word. They see the glory of God, God's holiness, God's forgiveness, his mediation. And what's so special about the Holy of Holies? Who lives there? Who dwells there? God dwells there. You get a sense of God's presence among sinners in the tabernacle. That's what you get there. And so David is like, I'm thirsty for God. I'm hungry for God. I'm desperate for God. My body is fainting for God. So I'm going to go to the sanctuary and I'm going to see God's glory and his strength in all of these things that God has prescribed for us as people. What's the application for us today? Christians, seek God. Long for God. Pray to God and tell him you want to draw near to him. Now here's the main goal, and I'm just going to unpack this a little bit more. But the, the phrase I'm going to use is gaze on God. When you're in the wilderness, gaze on God. That's what I think the call is of this whole psalm. But let's think about this. When, I, when, I, when I'm applying this to you, at least from this passage, from this verse, verse 2, where should you gaze on God? In the sanctuary. Now, does that mean you need to go to Jerusalem? I've been to Jerusalem. There is no temple there anymore. There is a, a, a Muslim dome of the rock right there with a golden dome right there if you go to the temple mount. But there is a model tabernacle in the wilderness. The Jews have set up a model tabernacle where you can see a life-size tabernacle exactly the way it's prescribed in the Bible. Is that where you need to go right now to gaze on God's glory? No. no. Then where? Where should you go? Where should you go to gaze on the glory of God in his sanctuary? You should go to the one who said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll raise it up. That's where you go. To that temple. Who said that? Jesus did. And Jesus was not talking about a building. What was he talking about? His himself and his own body. When he says, destroy this temple and in three days, I'll raise it. He's talking about his own physical body. Look to me. So if you want to look to God's sanctuary, look to Jesus. Jesus is where God and man meet. Jesus is the high priest who makes the sacrifice. Jesus is the sacrifice. He is the temple. All the glories of God that you would see if you went to the tabernacle were shadows. Christ Jesus is the substance. He is the glory of God. And Becca just read for us John 1, where, where uh, the word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only son from the father full of grace and truth that's what we read from exodus 34 a god merciful and gracious abounding in love and truth what is jesus glory in john 1 a glory that's full of grace and truth if you want to see the glory of god if you're desperate in the wilderness don't go to the sanctuary in israel gaze on Jesus Christ, where the guilty are forgiven and punished at the same time. Because God does not clear the guilty. He punishes every sin. And if you're a Christian, he punishes your sin on Christ. And you're in Christ. So you're punished with Christ. But because God raised Christ from the dead, you're also raised with Christ. And now you're free. You're both punished and forgiven in Jesus Christ. That is where the glory of God is at its brightest and at its highest display. Now, where is Jesus today? Okay, PJ, you're saying, look at Jesus. Where do I look at Jesus? Where's Jesus today? At the right hand of the Father, right? Where he is physically, he's at the right hand of the Father in heaven. So where is the sanctuary on earth today? Where's the sanctuary? On earth, where? Us, the people of God, right? The, the church. We are the temple. We are the sanctuary. So if you want to gaze on God's glory and hear of the glory of God, where do you go? Go to the church. And when I say the church, I'm not talking about this building. This building is not the church. This building, this room is not the sanctuary. Who is the sanctuary? You are the sanctuary. We gathered together are the holy place. You are the temple where you display God's glory. So I wonder what you see when you look at each other. What do you see when you come on Sunday? Why are you here? What are you looking for? Just looking to greet people? What do you see? Do you see God's strength and glory when you look at each other? When you hear people sing 
songs like were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small where else are you going to find people who are going to say give me the whole world and that's not enough there's only one place I can go to find people who can sing that with all their heart and that's the gathered church we're going to, where am I going to find people who are so satisfied and longing for God that the world is not enough for them it's you BBC it's you I come to see you and when I see you, I see the strength and glory of God. As I look around, I see people who are suffering, and yet they're suffering and they're holding on. I see people who are fighting sin, and they're, they're more feeling more defeated than, than successful, and yet they're holding on. I see people who are discipling other people and praying for other people and caring for other people. I see people who are caring for each other's children and weeping with those who weep and rejoicing with those who rejoice. You know what I see? The glory of God. I see Jesus in the body of Christ. I see our head, the Lord Jesus in you. And so when you are in the wilderness, you need to see God's glory. You need to see Jesus. And so you should run to the sanctuary. Better is one day in these new covenant courts than a thousand elsewhere. And I just got my Disneyland pass for the year. <laughs> I'm singing that song, thinking a thousand days in Disneyland or one day with God's people. According to this song, one day with God's people. Easily. That is the, ha the happiest place on earth. <laughs> C.J. Mahaney has a sermon about the church called The Happiest Place on Earth. Because it is. And it's not just because of us. It's because God is in us. The Spirit lives in us. You see grace and mercy and forgiveness and repentance and struggling and hard-heartedness and longing for God. You see it all here in God's people. Church family, you are the sanctuary. So continue to display God in your love. Don't try to pretend to just love Jesus and keep following Jesus. That's what you do. And you get to see God's glory actually even in the Lord's Supper, right? This is my body given for you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. You get to see and tangibly feel and eat things that show you the glory of God in Christ's death and resurrection. And not only that, you get to look around and see other people taking it and you see the body of Christ, the church, when you take the Lord's Supper. You get to see the glory of God. So habitually attend church gatherings. And when you come, I wanna encourage you to just, to just pause and say to yourself, what am I really seeing here? Or you can even just pray this when you come to church gathering, God, Show me your glory. And God has a multifaceted glory that you can see glory in someone struggling with sin. You can see glory in someone forgiven of sin. You can see some glory in someone who's not in a season of trial. You can see God's glory in someone who's suffering deep in deep trial. Everyone displays God's glory in different ways and everyone together loving each other as we're going through what we're going through displays God's glory together in a way that you can't display God's glory on your own. So, come to the church gatherings and see God's glory. If you're not a Christian, I just talked about the glory of God in Jesus. This is the best news in the world because God is holy and we are sinners who deserve God's judgment and God will not leave the guilty unpunished. He will punish everyone who's guilty and guess what? Every one of you here, Christian and non-Christian, you are guilty of sin. Children, you're guilty of sin. Everyone here is guilty of sin and God will not leave the guilty unpunished. God will punish the guilty. Your only hope is God's son. God, the word, was God, became flesh, lived among us, tabernacled among us, lived the perfect life, died on the cross for our sins, and was raised from the dead. So that if you repent from your sins, and if you trust in Jesus, God will forgive you of your sins, cleanse you, live in you, and walk with you for the rest of your life. So if you're not a Christian, repent from your sins today and trust in Jesus. Don't trust yourself. Don't trust your goodness. Don't trust your religion. Trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. Let me say one more word here. Um, or one, one word to the children, one to the discouraged children. If you're going to see God's glory on Sunday, it's hard for you to see it. It's hard for you if you've grown up in the church to see it because this is your whole life, right? I mean, you, you, you go to church every Sunday. Your parents are devoted members of this church. And so you're here so regularly, it's such a normal part of your life, 
that it seems unremarkable. There's no glory here. This is just normal. This is my church family. This is my parents' church family. This is just what I do. No, you need to understand that what you see here is more glorious than anywhere else in the world. There's more glory here than anywhere else in the world. So kids, ask your parents questions. Ask them what it means. Ask them why they love Jesus. Ask them how they were encouraged today. Ask them how they saw God's glory. And if you're discouraged here and you're like, man, PJ, you're just giving me another obligation. You're telling me to gaze on glory and think about God's glory. I'm just discouraged. I just need God to pick me up. Well, let me encourage you. You're here, right? Why are you here? God brought you here. God brought you here. God planned for you to be here. God's not even asking you to prepare a sermon. He's just asking you to sit there and listen. Because God is showing you his glory. He's declaring to you his glory through Psalm 63 and through my mouth right now. His glory is hitting your eardrums to change your life. If you just have ears to hear. So listen and see. See with your ears and listen with the eyes of your heart. All right, so that's the main goal. The main goal is when you're stuck in the wilderness, confidently gaze on God. Now, how? I'm going to take the rest of this time to unpack the rest of the psalm on how we constantly gaze, or how do we, how do we confidently gaze on God when we're in the wilderness? Okay, so again, my main goal is when you're stuck in the wilderness, confidently gaze on God. And I'll give you three ways here that David is showing us by the way, the way you confidently gaze on God when you're stuck in the wilderness and you're overwhelmed is by being resolved to, one, to praise God, secondly, to trust God, and then to hope in God. To praise, to trust, and to hope. To praise God, to trust in God, and to hope in God. And as I, as I unpack it, I'll, I'll even make it a little bit, I'll, I'll expand a little bit by saying, by praising God for His love. And by trusting God in the darkness of night. And by hoping in God when everything feels hopeless. Let's look at these one at a time. Verses 3 through 5, by praising God for his love. If you're going to see God and gaze on God's, on God's glory, you need to do it by praising God for his love. Look at verses 3 through 5. Here's David's resolve. Because God is good, my lips will glorify you. He's resolved. He's committed. He's not saying, I am glorifying you. My lips will glorify you. I'm committed to glorifying you. Because of, uh, why? Because your faithful love is better than life. Look at verse four. So I will bless you as long as I live. So I'll glorify you with my lips. Verse four, I'm resolved to bless you. I will bless you as long as I live. And then in verse four as well, at your name, I will what? Lift up my hands. I will lift up my hands. I'll not just praise you with my lips or with my heart, but with my actual words, with my actual body. I will lift up my hands to you, God. I'll bless you. I'll glorify you. I'll praise you. I'll lift up my hands. And then in verse 5, you satisfy me with rich food, as with rich food. You satisfy me as with rich food. My mouth will, my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. David is saying, I'm going to keep being satisfied in you. I'm going to keep pursuing my satisfaction in you. Indeed, I am satisfied by you as with rich food. The translation there, the little translation is as with fat and fatness. What does it mean to be satisfied with fat and fatness? Now, in David's day, your diet wasn't what we have today, right? Um, it's not what we have today. Um, we are spoiled with food. We have refrigeration. We don't hunt for our food. We don't grow our food. We just go buy it and bring it and store it. Um, I was just in New Orleans with, with Peter for Southern Baptist Convention. They have pretty good food, but there's no place like Los Angeles. <laughs> we just, you know, I just have, I've learned after traveling that I just need to, you know, taper my expectations because I just think, oh man, this is going to be so good. I always think, oh, there's a better place in LA that has this. Now, there's some things in New Orleans that is unique that we don't have here, just to be fair, in, in that regard, most recently. But, but we, we just have so much access to food. And we like to be, and that, that's the image here, being satisfied with rich food because eating with fat and fatness, eating meat is a delicacy. And David says, I'm satisfied like with the richest of foods. If it's my family day at my, for our family, and I ask our kids, where do you guys want to eat? The answer will always be the same, world without end, never fails. It will be what? Korean barbecue. Yeah, Korean barbecue. That's it. <laughs> Korean barbecue. And if one of the siblings steps out of line and says a different restaurant, everyone else 
He stares at them and puts the pressure of their eyeballs. You know the right answer. That is not the right answer, right? Because they want, they want to go there and they want to be satisfied with the fat and fatness of Korean barbecue. Just indulge in Korean barbecue. And that's what David's saying here. Like, I'm just so satisfied with indulging. I'm longing for you, God, as with fat and fatness. Now, why? Why does he look to God? Why, why will he praise God? Why, why, why can he be committed to praise God even in, in, even in the wilderness? Even when your son is chasing you, your son, it's crazy. Your son is trying to kill you. Can you, it's just hard to imagine that. that rock trying to kill me and like gathering people to like chase me. That's just crazy to think about. Like I can't even like get emotionally in that headspace, right? Of my son trying to kill me. But that's, David's actually experiencing that. His son is really trying to kill him. And in that he's, got, he's saying, my lips will praise you, God. I'm going to keep glorifying you. Yeah, my son wants to kill me. I'm, I'm on the run. I'm in the wilderness. But I'm going to glorify you. You're good. Why, how do you do that? Why can you do that? Look at verse, verse 3. Why, why can your lips glorify God? My lips will glorify you. Why? Because your, here's the key. Because your faithful love is better than life. God's covenant love. The love he has promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be his, to be their God and for God to be, for them to be God's people. This promise of God being their God and them being his people, that they would have God as their, as his, as their God. This covenant love is better than life. This echoes Psalm 73, 25 and 26, where the psalmist says, Asaph says, whom do I have in heaven but you? And I, I desire nothing on earth besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. God is my portion. His love is better than life. And if God's love is better than life, then God's love is better than everything else you get to enjoy in life. Right? If I don't have life, I can't enjoy my wife and kids. If I don't have life, I can't enjoy the church family. If I don't have life, I can't enjoy reading the Bible. If I don't have life, I can't... In, like, without life, I, it's like the key to enjoying everything else, Right? So if God's love is better than life, then God's love is better than everything. Everything else I love, everything else I think is good, God's faithful love is better. It's better than life. Do you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They were, they were told with everyone else that when the gold, when, there's a golden statue of Nebuchadnezzar, when you hear the, the trumpet, everyone needs to bow down and worship the golden statue. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse to do it. They're apprehended uh, by the authorities that are brought to King Nebuchadnezzar. And he says, why aren't you bowing down? And he says, we won't bow down. And then he says, what God is able to deliver you from me? And they say, our God is. And then they say this in, in Daniel 3.18. Our God is able to deliver us. And then he says, but even if not, hear that? Even if he doesn't deliver us, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Why can they say that? Because God's faithful love is better than life. And Paul even said, to live is Christ, but he said, to die is gain. It's better for me to die right now than to stay alive. It's better for me to die right now and leave my kids at their age right now than to stay alive. It's better for me to die right now and leave BBC where it is right now than to stay alive. That's what, that's, to die is game. Paul, that sounds like crazy talk. Nobody, nobody really feels that, do they? Paul did. David did. Because it's true. The faithful love of God is better than life. And when you know that, and your heart is gripped by that, your lips will glorify God in the wilderness. You will lift up your hands and praise to God in the wilderness for his faithful love. Just like John Piper says, the key to praising Christ is prizing Christ. When you love Jesus and his steadfast love, the love that he gives, because Jesus is the embodiment of covenant love, right? This cup is a new covenant in his blood. Jesus is the embodiment and security of the covenant love. Jesus is better than life. And when you prize Jesus... You praise Jesus. So let's 
Praise God. If we're gonna confidently uh, gaze on God, we need to do it by praising God. But let's move on. Verses six through eight. We gaze on God not only by praising God, we gaze on God in the sanctuary by trusting God in the darkness of night. Verses six through eight. By trusting God. When we're overwhelmed and we're gripped by fear, we trust God in the night. In the night, nighttime is scary time, right? When you're a kid, scared of the night, scared of the darkness. We need a nightlight because we don't want the darkness. We're scared of the night and of the darkness. And here's David in verse six saying, when I think of you as I lie on my bed, as I meditate on you during the night watches. So here's David at night meditating on God in verse six, thinking of God on his bed. When he says the night watches, there are different watches of the night from like 11 to 2 a.m. and 2 to 5 a.m. There are, there's like three or four hour blocks where if you're in the military, someone also always has to keep watch. So what night watch do you have? Do you have this slot or that slot or that slot? David's saying, when I'm in my bed, I'm not even like on the front, like at the watchtower, but even on my bed during the watches of the night, I'm thinking of God. I'm meditating on God in the night watches. And in verse Seven, he says, I re will rejoice in the shadow of your wings. Now, God doesn't have wings. God is not a bird. But the, the imagery there is that God, if you're in the shadow of the wings, you are what? Protected. You're safe. You're secure. And you're near. And so God watching over you, protecting you, you're right next to God. You're in God's presence. You're secure. You're safe. Nothing can threaten you because no one is stronger than God. You're in his presence. And then look at verse 8. I follow close to you. Another translation says, I cling to you. This word, follow close, I don't like that translation. The CSB there is, I like cling better. What translation has cling? Anyone here have cling? ESV. ESV has cling. Better translation here. I cling to you. Why? And you know what's even a better translation than that? Well, it would be really awkward here, but I'll, I'll say it and you'll immediately know why it's helpful. I cleave to you. What do you remember cleave from? Marriage, right? Leaving and cleaving. A man, a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Cling to his wife. And so David's saying the way that a husband cleaves to his wife and leaves everyone else in the same way, God, I'm clinging to you. I'm cleaving on to you. But you know what? You know why this is so good? Why when you trust God in the darkness of night? Because at night, when you're in the dark, like all your thoughts and worries come to you at night. They can, right? When you put your pillow on your head at night. And I love my wife. And she has been a faithful wife. Next week, we're celebrating. Next Sunday, we're celebrating our 18th anniversary. Next, next Sunday. So I'm not preaching next Sunday because of that. Um, but um, she's been faithful in all kinds of trials, and I hope I've been a faithful husband to her. But there's some burdens that she goes through or that I go through that as much as we're right there beside, like as much as I'm beside her, I can think of some pastoral burdens I've had here or in previous churches where she's right next to me and encouraging me, but she can't really be in the burden with me. Like I've cleaved to her, she's cleaved to me, but she can't be there with me and really like experience it in the full way I'm experiencing it. It's just not possible. And we know that more than anywhere else in the context of dying, right? I mean, when you die, when you're on your deathbed, your spouse can be there beside you. She or he can be holding your hand, the church family, us, we can go visit and, and be there with you, singing with you and praying for you and reading scripture right beside you, but we can't be, in, we can't go through death with you. Not even your wife or your husband who's, who's, who's you, whom you've left everyone to cleave to them. Not even they can enter into that pain with you. When you go through the gates of death, you go alone. That is the darkest of dark. That is the most wilderness of wildernesses, right? To be there on your deathbed and no one else can be with you. No one can cling to you. You're going on your own. You're alone. Or are you alone? Are you alone? I mean, verse eight, I cling to you. Is God there with you as you go through death? Look at verse eight. I follow close to you, I cling to you, and not only do I cling to you, that'd be one thing, but what does God do? Verse eight, 
Your right hand what? Holds on to me. So yes, my spouse cannot go with me through the gates of death. But God will be there with me. And God will be there with you. We cling to God. And God holds on to us with his right hand, his strong hand. If you're not a Christian, I wonder where you go to, who do you go to when you face your biggest fears? What is your hope as you get closer to death? Now, why should we trust God in the night? Not only because he's there with us, we read that from verse eight, but look at verse seven again. Or verse, yeah, verse seven, because God is your what? God is your helper. Now, again, I don't like the CSB translation here. I think the LAB or NASB gets it better. It's better translated past tense, I think. The reason why you can trust God in the night when it's dark is because God has been your help in the past. Question for you, just yes or no question, answer me. Has God been faithful to you in the past? Yes. God has been faithful to you in the past. So you know what you need to do? You need to remind yourself that God has been faithful to you in the past as you're in the night now and as you trust God in the night. Not only that, here's a church application for you, church family. You need to share with other people in this church and you need to hear from other people in this church how God has been faithful to them. Do you know each other's testimonies? Do you know how each other was converted? Do you know any trial that any of these members have gone through recently where God has been nothing but faithful? Where God has been a helper? Has God helped a fellow member of our church recently? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Do you know some of their stories? You need to know some of their stories. You need to ask them for their stories. You need to share some of your stories because when we're in the night and we're shaky and we don't know if we can really trust God, it's not just the gospel, it is the gospel, but it's not just the gospel, not just scripture. It's me knowing that God has been my helper. And when I'm not sure that God has been my helper, I know he's been Tanner's helper. I know he's been Justin's helper. I know he's been Barbara's helper. And if I know some of their stories, I can, even when I'm doubting in my own life that God is my helper, I know he's been, he is my helper because he's the helper of other members of our church. God will hold us fast. He will hold on to you. So he says, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be afraid for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold on to you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41, 10. So take your fears to God in the night. Trust God in the darkness. So if we're gonna gaze on God, we need to gaze on God by praising him for his love, by trusting him in the night, and lastly, by hoping in him when it feels hopeless. Look at verses nine through 11. Hoping in God when it feels hopeless. Look at verse nine. But those who intended to destroy my life will go into the depths of the earth. Verse 10, they will be given over to the power of the sword. They will become a meal for jackals. So if you oppose David, you're going to go into the depths of the earth. What does that mean? You're going to what? Die and be? Uh, Set to hell is... I don't think that's what's said here. That's a good guess, though. What happens after, we, after someone dies? What do we do with their body? We what? We bury them. How far do we bury them? Six feet deep. The depths of the earth. Just, you're burying them. Those who oppose David will die and be buried. They're going to die. Not only are they going to die. Verse, and I think all these are saying the same thing. They're going to die. They're going to go into the depths of the earth. If you seek to destroy David's life... Like Absalom or others, um, you're going to die. You're going to go into the depths of the earth. Verse 10, they'll be given over to the power of the sword, which means they're going to die by the sword. And then also in verse 10, they will become a meal for jackals, scavenging animals that are going to eat their flesh because they're not buried, right? Or, or, or attacked in the night. But if you oppose and try to destroy David's life, you will die. You will be destroyed. That's the point of verse, verses 9 and 10. But look at verse 11 in contrast. But the king will rejoice in God. Now, who's the king here? David's the king. Those who oppose David will be killed, but the king will rejoice in God. Not only will the king have a happy ending, look at the second part of verse 11. All who swear by the king will what? Will boast. So they'll also be victorious. I wonder if you have a problem. Am I my God? Yeah. Test, test, test. Battery. Battery. 
I wonder if you have a problem with the Old Testament and verses like this that are David-centered. A lot of the Psalms are David-centered. David-centric. If you oppose me, the king, you're going to die. If you swear by me, you're going to boast. If you try to destroy my life, God's going to end you. But me, I get to rejoice. It seems really weird. Like, David, you're a sinner just like me. Why do the Psalms speak in such a David-centric way? Well, you can say, well, because he's the king. And that's right. So the king is David. But we know that the greater king is David's son. Not just Solomon, but David's greater son. Who's that? Jesus, Jesus the Messiah. Jesus Christ. Look at Psalm 2. Again, you need, to, you need to have Psalm kind of in your back pocket, Psalms 1 and 2, when you are reading the Psalms, because they really are the gateway and the guardrails as you read through the Psalms. In Psalm 2, verses 6 through 8, this is God talking about his king. I, God saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my, my holy mountain. I will declare Yahweh's decree, says the king now. He said to me, God said to me, the king, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. So, the, so God's king is God's son. And, this is, and what happens with God's son? Well, look at verses 9 through 12. If you oppose God's king, God's son, God will break you with an iron scepter and he will shatter you like pottery. So now what's the application? In verse 10, be wise, receive instruction. Verse 11, serve the Lord, rejoice with trembling. And then verse 12, pay homage to whom? To the son, or he will be angry. Who is the son? Well, Jesus now, but who is the son, at least in the original audience for Psalm 2? David. David, or the king. Pay homage to Israel's king. Pay homage to the Davidic king. Or he will be angry and you'll perish in your rebellion. For his anger may ignite at any moment. All who take refuge in the king are happy. All who take refuge in David, the Davidic king. And so, obviously, David died, but the ultimate king is Jesus. If you take refuge in Jesus, you will boast, you will rejoice like David rejoices. And then let's finish the psalm, Psalm 63, verse 11. Why will you boast? Because your enemies, the mouths of liars, will be what? Will be shut. This is speaking of final judgment. There will be a final judgment. Psalm 1, 6, God's people will rejoice in the assembly of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. The way of the wicked will perish. They will not stand in the judgment. They will not be in the assembly of the righteous. They will be excluded from God and his people in judgment. And on judgment day, every lie they've told, every time they said Jesus wasn't worth it, or that you're going too far with your biblical Christianity, every time that they opposed you, their mouths in the end will be shut because they don't know Jesus, who is not only the way, but the truth. And if you don't speak of the truth, Jesus, truly, you are a liar. And if you're not on Christ's side, you are a liar because you believe the lies because you're not believing in the truth. And your mouth at the end of the day will be shut in the final judgment. So if you're not a Christian, just know this. There is a judgment day for all of us, Christians and non-Christians. And on that day, no one will be able to escape the judgment of God because none of us can escape the knowledge of God. He knows everything you've done. And you might be able to argue with me or other people here and convince us or at a standstill. Well, you say this, I say this, and it's just we we're kind of at a standstill. He said, she said. But on judgment day, when the final judge gives his final judgment, everyone's mouth will be shut. The final truth and vindication and judgment and condemnation will be handed down. Not just in terms of status, but even for, for all of the sins and disputes that we've gone through. So if you're not a Christian, be warned. But let's end with the, the happiness of verse 11. The king will rejoice in God. We will boast because we will rise from the dead. We will be forgiven of our sins. We are justified. We'll be given new bodies. We will live on a new earth with a river and, and the tree of life and we'll be with each other and we'll celebrate with no more tears, no more dying, no more pain. Only worship and joy and love with each other and others and exploration. And we will see God's face and his name will be written on our foreheads. 
And as David said in Psalm 16, in your presence is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. We will boast in God forever and ever and ever. So gaze on God by praising him for his love, by trusting him in the night and by hoping in this final judgment and resurrection, even when everything seems hopeless in your life. Because we don't gaze on God in our wilderness, but too often look to other gods and weaker gods and false gods, because we don't praise God for his covenant love, because we don't trust God in the night even though he's with us and he's been our helper and other people's helper, because we don't hope in God even though he's guaranteed a resurrection and a final judgment, we fail, we sin. Not only do we sin, our pastors sin. Pastor Peter sins and Pastor Ben sins and I sin. We have failed to, to, to gaze on God in this way. We deserve, all of us deserve, to go into the depths of the earth. All of us deserve to be given over to the power of the sword. All of us deserve to be eaten by jackals. All of us, all of us deserve our mouths to be shut and for us to be thrown into hell forever and ever and ever. We should be cut off from seeing the strength and glory of God, not just in this sanctuary, but in the final sanctuary, the new heavens and the new earth. We should be cut off from seeing and enjoying and being satisfied and having our thirst quenched with God's glory and his strength. There's only one who was devoted to God and gazed on God's glory and trusted God in the night and praised God for his love and hoped in God when things seemed hopeless. There's only one who actually, when he was praying that the cup would be passed from him, still believed that God's faithful love is better than life. He believed it so much that he was willing to drink the cup and go to the cross and die for our sins and be under the wrath of God because he knew that even as he took what you will never experience, even he knew that as he took the cup of wrath, that God's love would be better than life, not only for him, but for you and for me. He took the cup of wrath so that we would take the cup of blessing and know the new covenant in his blood, which is poured out for our forgiveness, for, the, for our fickle praise and our weak trust and our hopeless hoping and our excuses of why we gaze on every other God but the true God when we're in our wilderness. But now, thanks to Jesus, we have the power and the strength to gaze on this God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray. Well, we praise you that you are glorious. We praise you for your steadfast love that's better than life. We praise you that you are our helper. We praise you that you hold on to us with your right hand. We praise you that in the end, we who have trusted in your king, the king, king Jesus, that we will boast and we will rejoice after the, at and after the final judgment. Not that we deserve to boast. We don't deserve any of this. But we thank you that you've given all of these things to us because of Christ. Help us to gaze on your glory in our wilderness and to trust you in our dark times. Draw us near to you, we pray. And help us to draw each other near to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's take the next three minutes to share.